Thank you, Bessie. And thank you, First United Methodist Church, for hosting this event. This is our third in the series. Um, in June, we did energy efficiency. In July, we did solar. And today, we're doing EVs. Uh, I like to think of this presentation as kind of the end of the trilogy. So I like to think of Star Wars, the first three Star Wars. And this is very much a Return of the Jedi presentation, right? There's fireworks, there's Ewoks, Darth Vader dies, but then we figure out he's a good guy after all. I mean, there's, what's not to like? And that's what's true about the electrification of transportation. And we're going to just jump right into it. The title of today's talk is going to run 90 minutes to 30 minutes shorter than the other two, uh, is EVs and beyond. And the beyond part, we're kind of going to nix because we're going to fill in with the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 that passed the House yesterday and what that means in terms of EVs. Okay, so let's get to it. Well, I say let's get to it. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, so why is electrifying the transportation sector so important? As Betsy mentioned, check out the pie graph here. We're talking about greenhouse gas emissions by sector of our economy. 27% is, is from transportation. So, you know, sitting in traffic jams, your cars, class eight trucks, going down the road, delivering all the packages that then get to Amazon facilities that then come to your house. These, this is our burden in terms of transportation. Um, and we joined the Paris Climate Accords not too long ago, and we have agreed to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 in order to uh, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. Now, the challenge with that is we've already warmed our planet 1.1 degrees since pre-industrial times, and so we have quite a bit of challenges ahead of us. There are political challenges, there are uh, entrenched interests, there's misinformation, there's all kinds of challenges, and that's just in the United States. Imagine if we have to get Sri Lanka to a place where they're net zero, or Honduras, et cetera. So it really is gonna be a global effort, and we're gonna be much more of a global village by the time this is over. All right, so let's jump right into the cars, vehicles, cars, SUVs, trucks, whatever. Hybrids, plug-in hybrids, BEVs, or battery electric vehicles. Now, the way that I've done these in the past, for those of you who haven't been here, is that I assume that no one knows anything about what I'm talking about, but that everybody's smart. So we're gonna kind of move along at a good clip, and that's because there's so much varied degrees of knowledge in the room, I don't wanna assume that you know something and then you're just lost on that first point. So what are hybrids? Hybrids are powered by an internal combustion engine and one or more electric motors, and the classic example of that is the Toyota Prius. I believe everyone, unless you've been living under a rock, has seen at some point in time in the last 25 years a Toyota Prius. Uh, and so the Toyota was introduced in October 1997. It's coming up on its 25th birthday. So it's been around for quite a while, and, you know, there have been improvements made, but largely the vehicle averages about 50 to 54 miles per gallon. It does a little better in town because of regenerative braking, a little worse on the highway, but that's, that's been historically pretty good. So regenerative braking is a concept where you're not just getting the physical brake of the brake pad on the rotor to stop, slow the vehicle. You're, you're actually going to recover in regenerative braking, which is true of hybrids, true of plug-in hybrids, and true of battery electric vehicles. Some of the energy, when you're moving forward, some of that energy will go back into the batteries. And that's why these vehicles are so efficient. <clears throat> the bottom picture here is the Ford C-Max. It's also a hybrid. Okay, breaking down the drivetrains for uh, plug-in hybrids. So imagine a hybrid, and then imagine a plug that goes into the car that has additional battery storage. Um, rather, so this is from Toyota. Rather than having two engines working simultaneously, plug-in hybrid vehicles use gasoline engine as a backup and when the engine, and for when the en electric engine is out of charge. The distance traveled while operating solely on the battery is known as the vehicle's electric range. So in a plug-in hybrid, you have the option of driving exclusively on electricity for some predetermined range. And in our household, we've owned both of these vehicles. Uh, the, the, one, the blue one is the Prius Prime. It's a plug-in hybrid. And depending on whether it's winter or summer, because batteries do worse in the winter, this vehicle will fetch about 23 
to 32 miles of range, all electric. And that's important because think about what you're driving on a daily basis. So much of what you do can just be done going to the store, going to, going to church, going to a community meeting, going to get something to eat. And then you come back in and you plug in just as you close the car of your door. You wouldn't leave your car door wide open. It just becomes habitual and you plug in and you're driving on electricity. And that's good because it means zero emissions and it's much cheaper than gas. Uh, so if a Prius hybrid gets 50 to 54 miles a gallon, what might a plug-in hybrid get of the Prius Prime? Well, in our household, my wife averaged about 70 miles per gallon. And I averaged 88 because I'm a better driver. I don't run the air conditioner full blast, I don't listen to rock music, and I don't clip corners like she does and lose hubcaps. So I'm a little better of a driver. So I would, but think about that, 88 miles per gallon. And now granted, that's plugging in also, but in terms of actually filling up the gas tank, uh, this is pre $5 a gallon gas. So even then it was just kind of a joke. I drove, I remember I first got in it, it was my first anything. And I, I had to do a fly and drive, which we're going to talk about that towards the end of the program because there are shortages throughout the nation. And sometimes if you want a vehicle, you don't go local. You get on a plane, fly somewhere, and then drive it back. And I flew to Connecticut, and I got this car, and I you know, put it around 25 miles, all electric. And then I drove, almost, I drove pretty much to Raleigh and just didn't fill up. And I was blown away by that um, technology. So time goes by, and... Uh, you know, I like to see cars, like through cars in front of me so I can get an idea of traffic. So we got an SUV, a big blobby American SUV. The RAV4 pictured here is the best-selling SUV in America. You see them everywhere. However, they're not all the same. There's the just gas-powered variant, there's the hybrid, and there's the plug-in hybrid. We own a plug-in hybrid, and it is a unicorn. Uh, more recently, if you're on Autotrader trying to find a RAV4 Prime, you would have maybe seen 15 available in the country. And there's a reason for that, because in California, the price of gas is six and seven dollars, and people are like, that's it, I, I want this other car. So inventory is very low. Uh, this vehicle, a typical hybrid uh, RAV4 Prime will get 38 to 41 miles of range. And with the plug-in hybrid, you can expect then to get more. And of course, that's based on your driving behavior. I work at the VA, I live in Waynesville, I work seven out of 14 days every two weeks, so I have a 75-mile round-trip commute. The uh, all-electric range on this vehicle is 42 in the winter to 52, I found out, in the summer. So I can go to the VA, come back, get to about eh, exit 44, somewhere between 44 and 37, and then it clicks over to hybrid, and then I'm just on hybrid. Uh, when the price of gas was at its zenith here in North Carolina, I was thinking, what, June, late May, June, I, my cousin bought a, a Suburban, which was a really bad decision on his part. Uh, he has a large family, so it's okay, but he was just belly aching all the time. So, you know, being a good family member, I texted him a picture of the gas pump where I filled up my car, and I said, I'll text you again when I have to refill. Five weeks later... 2,234 miles later, I went to the gas station again, and I filled up the car for whatever it was, $45, $50. So that's good, because when you're driving an electric vehicle, we're going to talk about, you know, you're not subject to the geopolitics, right, the saber rattling, whatever goes on in the Straits of Hormuz or Russia and Ukraine. You're just, you buy yourself some insurance and insulate against that, and we'll talk more geopolitics. Okay, so that is a plug-in hybrid. Has a plug. Yes? Uh, well, so you have an option. You can press a button. I can press a button in a car and I can just start on hybrid. But why would I want to do that? I, I plugged in, the electricity's cheaper, it's silent, it's faster, so I always start with electricity. And then you enter this little dance in a hybrid where you go back and forth. And the only time you would ever know that it's in pure electric range is if you're in a parking lot and you're going along real slow and you hear the electrical little whinny that you often hear in a parking lot when you see a Prius come by. So, so that's it. All right. So plug-in hybrids, are they better than hybrids? I, you know, I'm one person. These are, in some cases, my opinions. I think yes. Uh, and for the reasons that I mentioned, I can get greater gas mileage 
um, from it, and that's better in terms of emissions, it's better in terms of climate change, and it's just a more, it's, it's more fun to drive. Um, one of the audience members who's here today, we first discussed a long time ago when I first went to the Blue Ridge EV Car Club uh, Christmas dinner at New Belgium Brewery, uh, and I was like, well, I have a plug-in hybrid. And it's like, yeah, plug-in hybrid is a gateway drug to electric vehicles. <laughs> so but you, you get a little taste of the electrification and how much fun it is, and then your electric range runs out, and you get back to the sort of internal combustion engine variant, and it's just no bueno. It's just not as much fun doesn't accelerate as fast, and then you eventually just jump into a battery electric vehicle. So um, what are some of the good things? I mean, a plug-in hybrid will plug in using a level one or a level two charger where a level one charger comes with the car. You just plug into a standard 110 outlet outside your home or in your garage and you charge it so you don't have to make any upgrades. What's the best use can, scenario at this time for a plug-in hybrid? Right, because technology is changing so fast. We have two plug-in hybrids, so clearly we think there was some utility in getting them, but we also have orders, reservations, now confirmed into orders for battery electric vehicles, because that's how we would prefer to ultimately drive. I can, I can think of a use case scenario in the southeast where having a plug-in hybrid might be preferable to having a battery electric vehicle, if it's not a Tesla, and that would be perhaps Let's say that you're just always on the road. You're a traveling salesperson, you live in Florida, you go to Florida every week, whatever it is, you can't make up your mind whether you wanna be here or in Florida, and so every week you drive back and forth. I could see where being in a battery electric vehicle and having to stop and charge could become slightly burdensome. Because when you're in a RAV, when you're in a RAV4 Prime, you, you did the electric part and then you're in hybrid, and if you just wanna do that, that's fine, but you're adding just a few hours by charging on a very long road trip. So that's a use case that I could consider. Um, but the thing, that th the thing to think about hybrids is, so does a hybrid, a standard hybrid, not a plug-in hybrid, but does a hybrid have a place in today's market? In other words, should one buy a hybrid, like a Toyota Prius, not the plug-in, just the regular? And I would argue yes and no. I would not buy a new hybrid because the, the, the technology's old. But if I was in a used car market and I wanted to get 54 miles of range and I had budgetary restrictions, then yes, absolutely, right? Uh, you, new cars are only sold once. Used cars are sold again and again. Two thirds of cars in America that are sold are used cars. So those hybrids are gonna have a life in someone else's registration. Someone else is gonna own that vehicle. But if you're interested in buying a new vehicle, I would argue that a hybrid is quickly becoming an obsolete technology. Can I make the case for a plug-in hybrid? Yes, as I just mentioned, if you're going all over the place. But again, remember, most of the driving you do locally, you could benefit from using just that electric uh, range that the, that the vehicle affords. Uh, and that's what we've experienced, and that's why in our RAV4 Prime that's parked in the parking lot, I'm averaging just under 70 miles a gallon, and that's remarkable in an SUV. Not only that, it's remarkable because Toyota basically just stuck a bunch of stuff up underneath the car, and it has two different drivetrains, um, which is probably why eventually the plug-in hybrids circa between 2025 and 2030 will become more expensive than battery electric vehicles because you're just having to put two different drivetrains in there and that's just inherently more expensive. Okay, now moving on to battery electric vehicles. When people talk about EVs, they're mostly talking about this. And this is BEVs, battery electric vehicles. They use no gas, diesel, and have no combustion engine. They operate exclusively on electricity. I don't know why I need to mention that, because I'll show someone a fully electric car, and I'll say, look, it's fully electric. And then someone will say, well, where do you put the gas? <laughs> there is no gas, you know, so it takes a while. Okay, so range on a battery electric vehicle, nowadays, you know, 250 to 400 miles, it depends. You know, more of them are gonna be in the, in the, in the neighborhood of, of, say, 250 to 315, and then there's some uh, probably more luxurious vehicles that are gonna fetch about 400 miles of range, depending on the model and the battery pack size. The great thing about battery electric vehicles, they offer instant torque. So imagine, you know, plugging in a, a drill at your house, 
and you just mash it all the way. Right? There's no, you're not, you're not going from first gear to second gear to third gear. It's just boom, it's instant. And that makes battery electric vehicles a lot of fun to drive, especially off the line. They tend to be very quick, they accelerate very quick. The zero to 60 times are impressive. Okay, also a thing to understand about battery electric vehicles, because people will say things like, where do you charge? And we're gonna get into charging later, is that 90 to 95% of your charging is done at home, which is great if you're a single family household, right? Because you have your own home, your home is your castle. If you live in a multifamily apartment type setting or duplexes, or it gets a little more complicated, right? Because then you have to figure out the landlord, um, and that's something for policymakers to think about as we create new uh, developments in this area that are multifamily housing. How are we going to future-proof for the public additional charging opportunities? Um, so let's take, you know, this is going to be a popular truck in this area when it does come out. Ford has made currently about 4,000 Ford F-150 Lightnings, so they're, kind of, they're very much unicorns at this point. But if you had a Ford F-150 extended range in this area, which has a 131 kilowatt hour battery pack, you could fill this up in Waynesville with your town electric, and this is not the newest rate, but the, the last rate from a couple months ago. You could fill it up for $15.75. When in your life would you ever fill up a full-size pickup truck for $15.75? Especially today, it's well over $100, I think, or close to it. And so, yeah, and so you can drive about 320 miles EPA-rated range in that vehicle, and then you're just plugging in at night, or plugging in when you go to a fast charger, or plugging in when you go to Ingalls. And this is the, so what you can see behind here is this is the technology. And for a battery electric vehicle, it's called a skateboard technology. So you have either one or two motors on either end. So think of a skateboard with the, ax the axles. And then you have along the floorboard, you have the batteries. And what that, what that structure does, you have no transmission tunnel like you do in a normal car. You have much more cabin space. So you can look at the exterior size of a car, a vehicle, an SUV, whatever. And you can say to yourself, well, that's not, it's not big enough for me, but it will be. Because if it's a bespoke EV architecture, as in it's not some afterthoughty, let's just stick some batteries up its rear and call it a day, which some manufacturers do, then what you're going to notice is you have lots more cabin space. So to give an example, if you're familiar with the VW Tiguan and the VW Atlas, that's just the Atlas is bigger than the Tiguan. The, if it was an EV-sized Tiguan, it would have the interior cabin space of the Atlas. So then you're starting to check boxes for Americans, right? Because we like to do everything. We want to take everything with us, and cabin space is important. Okay, so I want to stop at this moment and just, you know, people, I have conversations with folks, you know, I work at the VA, I have patients, and they'll say something about EVs, and I just can't back away from the conversation because it's where I live. And so people will say things like, electric car, they're never going to work. They're never going to you know, I have had this our whole life, I had a combustion vehicle. We're not going to do it. It'll never work. And it will work for all kinds of reasons we'll talk about. But let's just think about a diff something different. What if everything in your life ran on gas? So cue the video, and we'll see if this works. So isn't that a neat commercial? Because it turns on, the, on, on its head everything that you would think about the whole gas part, right? I mean, a hair dryer that runs, I mean, everything that we've used electric, we've never questioned, can we just have a gas-powered variant of that, you know? So I, I think that's a great commercial. I like it. Okay, how many EVs are there currently in the world? There are 20 million passenger EVs on the road, 1.3 million commercial EVs, including buses, delivery vans, and trucks, and there are 280 million electric mopeds, scooters, motorcycles, and three-wheelers. And that's, uh, that's from Bloomberg more recently, the research part. Um, so those numbers are interesting because 280 million, you don't see those in America. Where are all those electric mopeds at? Asia, India. Right? Countries where the cost of gasoline is prohibitive, and so you have to sip it, and then when you get an opportunity to jump to something else, you do. And so featured here is an electric bus. I was at Drive Electric Earth Day in Charlotte on April 23rd, and I got to see the all-electric bus. Very quiet, very neat, very robust build-out of its charging infrastructure in Charlotte, and they're on board, uh, you know, they're, they're working towards 
getting to net zero by 2050. There's an electric motorcycle up on the top right, and then of course to the left is the Tesla Model 3. Okay, so who's driving EV adoption in America? Contrary to some people's opinion, it's not President Biden. Biden wants everybody to drive an EV. Biden wants everybody to drive electric cars. Somebody's going to come and take away your truck. No, that's not true. Because at the end of the day, the American president, whoever the American president is, only has so much power. Certainly signing on Monday the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 will help juice EV development and sales in the United States. But really, think globally for a minute. Think from 30,000 feet. Who's really driving EV adoption in the world? Well, it's China and it's Europe. So if you can see here, uh, the sort of green color in the middle is the United States. That's our EV adoption rate from 2010 to 2021. And what you can see here worldwide is that this is a hockey stick phenomenon. It's really taken off. The top one is Europe, and the bottom, the dark blue one there is China. So China wants to be, it wants to be electrified. And they've wanted to do this for a long time. They don't have the sort of inherent fossil fuels. They don't have the relationships in the Middle East. They don't want to be dependent on that. And they've had a plan for a very long time to electrify their transportation sector. And they're doing it in a very big way. Uh, now we go over to Europe. And why might Europe want to electrify? Well, more recently, clearly, it has a lot to do with their dependence on Russia, right? The price of gas in, in Europe has been very expensive. And, and, and taxing for folks. Uh, the price of gas in select world markets. This is interesting. I found this on the Washington Post a, a month or so ago. Look at the price of gas and look at the average annual income. So think about the fact that the price of gas, I don't think in Waynesville ever eclipsed $5 a gallon. Well, look at that. You're paying $8 a gallon in France. Colombia has some natural resources, so they've subsidized theirs in 217 a gallon. But look how much you make a year. $5,246. South Korea is high, the United Arab Emirates is high, Germany was paying 746, and they have an average annual income similar to ours. South Africa, $5.61 for someone who makes $4,862 a year. So those are the people on mopeds. Those are the people on moped, electric mopeds and gas-powered mopeds. And then India, I think probably the worst case scenario of it all. Look at that, $5.08, and you're not making even $2,000 a year. So India, with over a billion people, represents a huge market and an opportunity for the two-wheeled electric mopeds and, and motorcycles. Um, so just look at the burden. I mean, Americans kvetch and moan about the cost of gas, and certainly it's been high. Uh, but look at the burden that other people face in other countries. All right, so for a minute we'll talk about the direct manufacturing cost of electric vehicles. So this is the price. This is a very multicolored, so I'll try to break this down. The black part here, I think, is the important part, and that is the cost of the battery. So if you have a gas variant car, clearly there's no battery, so there's your cost. And this is for a manufacturer to produce. Uh, a modified EV, so think in terms of uh, a plug-in hybrid or some non-bespoke EV architecture, that's the battery cost pretty high in 2025. And EVs are, by themselves are already cheaper than these modified plug-in hybrids by 2025. And then, look here. See how gas is the cheapest in 2025, a gas variant to produce? Now, in 2030, the EV is the cheapest to produce. And that's huge for manufacturers because that's what they want to do. The thing about this skateboard architecture is you can take one, this one sort of, uh, you can take this one base and you can throw on top of it multiple types of models, which makes, streamlines your manufacturing and makes it much easier. Uh, John Feichter's sitting over there. We were at Electrification 2022 in Charlotte in June. And I believe that the first breakout session that we went to was called 50% EVs by 2030, let's get to it. So we went to the plenary session at this utility scale conference, right? I'm a nurse, I'm a volunteer, what am I doing there? It was a lot of industry, a lot of industry. And so we go to this first breakout session after the first plenary session, and it is standing room only, and it is hot. Everybody wanted to be there to hear about EVs. 
And up on the, pan the panelists were from Kia, Toyota, GM, and Ford. And what they were saying was, the ship has sailed. The ship has sailed. Ford is investing $6 billion in the Blue Oval Factory that's going to straddle Tennessee and Kentucky. And that means jobs, jobs, jobs in Tennessee and Kentucky. But they are all in. And they're all in for reasons mentioned just a little bit ago. Europe and China. We have 330 million people. China has 1.4 billion, and Europe has a lot of people. So if you're an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, you don't want to make a bunch of different cars for all these different people in the world. You want to make kind of more or less one type of car, which is why EVs are going to be driven so much. Interestingly, at this conference also, all kinds of different breakout sessions, regulatory stuff, DOT, you name it. Everyone that we went to, it didn't matter if they weren't talking about EVs. By the time they really got into it, they were talking about EVs. Everybody is interested in this because the utilities are trying to figure out not is there enough transmission. There is enough transmission. A Department of Energy spokesperson got up there, who's one of the keynote speakers, and it says we only use 40% of our lines. The challenge is when you get to that last point, you have to then create uh, a really powerful architecture in these chargers, these superchargers, like you might see at Sam's Club in, in Asheville. You have to stub that out. You also have to do it in corridors. And DOTs and Department of Environmental Qualities and electrical engineers don't get together real often. They operate in silos. So if you're building a new interstate or building a new rest area, how are you going to stub out for that architecture? You're going to have to figure out a way to do it. And that's what all these different groups are working on. And the Ford guy was really, the GM guy was really kind of a trip because he would just sort of say, tell it like it is. And basically, you know, for someone that said the EVs aren't going to be the thing, that they're just not going to happen, no, the ship has sailed. You might as well just fully disrobe, stand out in the middle of Main Street and scream at the rain. And people will look at you like you're funny because that's the way people in industry now look at the public who says that. You're, you're not a decision maker. It's already happened. These, these car companies are making this and they're making it quickly. Okay, so again, some sort of global stuff. Um, things we've been dealing with for the last two, two and a half years, right? Gas prices more recently, inflation more recently, supply chain constraints since COVID. Keep in mind that for the first two quarters, especially the second quarter of 2022, large parts of China were still shut down. You know, we've gotten our vaccinations or we've had COVID or both, and we've largely gone along with life because viruses typically become more contagious and less virulent, and that's sort of the pathway. China doesn't have good vaccines. The Sinovac vaccine is not good. A lot of their seniors are not uh, vaccinated. And for whatever reasons, the Chinese Communist Party has this zero COVID policy. They're just not going to allow it. But nature will do its thing. The virus will do its thing. So throughout the last six months, they've shut down certain parts of the country. And that's really hurt supply chain. And I don't know what their plan going forward is. Okay, so we've had pandemic effects. China... We've had the semiconductor problems with Taiwan. Uh, wire harnesses coming from Ukraine for European manufacturers, because all of a sudden they're at war with Russia. Lots and lots of problems, right? And you can't just take a vehicle and just put it on the road. You have to have all the different parts to make that vehicle work for a customer. And then, of course, you know, gas prices have been hugely influential in the transition, or at least interest, in electric vehicles. Because, you know, Locally, the rate of electricity I pay is pretty much the same. You know, there's a little bit of an increase not long ago, but and that's to be expected. Uh, but it's nothing like what happens with the price of gas. And of course, there's been some price gouging, not just with gas, but with other goods too. If, if, the, if, if customers, if the public bakes into its mind the idea that tomorrow something will cost more, then you buy it today irrespective of its cost. And certain manufacturers, especially clothing companies, have really jumped on that, and their profits have been quite good. All right. Now we're going to do a cost of ownership analysis. It's 1030. Good. We're making good time. Cost of ownership analysis. At any point in time in your life that you've bought a combustion vehicle, you've gone on a lot, you've kicked the tires, you've looked at the trim, is it the color you want? Does everybody in the family like it? And then you look at the gas mileage maybe on the sticker price, but you kind of more or less already know what it is, right? If it's a big truck, it might be, if you're lucky, 20 miles a gallon. If it's a SUV, it might be 27. If it's a car, it might fetch 32 to 35. But that's it. It's a secondary consideration. When you buy a vehicle, an average American pays $42,000 for a new vehicle. 
then you have not baked into that equation how much you're going to pay in gas for the amount of time that you own it. Because that was never, there was never an alternative. You just, you just assume that you're going to put gas in a vehicle. But when you're talking about EVs, it's important to have this cost of ownership analysis. Because people will say, well, EVs cost more. They do, but the price is coming down. But you can't just look at the sticker price. You have to factor in what the cost of ownership is. And our household, well, I, me, I don't say my wife so much. She just kind of goes along with it. But I hate recurring costs, right? I hate recurring costs. I'm a nurse. I make what I make. I can't do anything about that. I can't, you know, I can work a little bit of overtime, but they're pretty stingy with it. So the one thing I can do to have more disposable income is to reduce my cost. And so I'm always looking at that and analyzing, how can I get the cost of this or this or this down? And with respect to electric vehicles, um, it's just, it's just so obvious to me, because if I'm paying 11.233 cents per kilowatt hour from town of Waynesville, then I'm not paying $5 for gas. All right, so cost of ownership analysis. This is a, this is a study we're going to show you. It has several slides, and these are some of the assumptions that are made in this tool, okay? So this is a fleet procurement analysis tool. It does not include Build Back Better, because there is no Build Back Better. It just talks about the existing federal tax credit of $7,500 for electric vehicles for those eligible car companies. Home charging assumes to be 88%. Public charging costs were drawn from Electrify America. Manufacturer suggested retail price was drawn from fuel economy at .gov. So they're just telling you how they got the sources for all their data. Importantly, no climate cost or benefits were factored into these calculations. Okay, so cost of ownership. And this assumes eight years of ownership. So electric vehicles cost more. There's a Toyota Corolla. This is a sub $30,000 car. And there's a Chevy Bolt, which is a sub $30,000 car. And the cost of ownership for the Bolt is less. And not only that, it's actually less now because this, is, this information is taken prior to GM knocking another $6,000 off the Bolt. We owned a Chevy Bolt. We bought one in 2019. The sticker price on it was $40,000. Not a lot of improvements have been made to the car, because at the time I considered the car to be a compliance vehicle from GM. The trim was fairly dumpy, and um, it was 40,000 bucks. Today that car is $26,500. And the trim is better, much better, because the cost of batteries has fallen, and it gets longer range. It used to get 238, now it gets 259 miles of, of range. Um, so there you go. There's a, a Chevy Bolt, the cost of ownership throughout eight years is $47,000. And we go to the mid-cost sedan. Here is a Lexus ES250 versus a Tesla Model 3. Again, the Tesla wins. Tesla's found to be 4.8% less expensive. And importantly, in, these, in all of these charts, what's important is you see the purchase price is in blue, right? So it's an escalated purchase price. But then you have fuel. See how little the fuel is on the Tesla in terms of electricity? And also maintenance and repairs. Uh, Toyota sends me, you know, whatever, a little text, and it's like, come get your tires rotated. Because that's kind of it. You're not doing much more than that. SUV segment. Okay, so this is the, Volks, the new Volkswagen ID4 versus the Honda CRV. And there we go, we see again that the electric vehicle is cheaper. And this is independent, you know, analysis from someone that is not vested in electric vehicles. 15.6% cheaper. And then the pickup truck segment. What they did here was they compared the Ford F-150 Lightning with the Ford F-150. Now there's a caveat to that because Ford just raised the price of the Ford F-150 Lightning $6,000 to $8,500 depending on your trim, but they also added in some extra goodies. Um, and that was, that was just coming because of supply chain constraints. And there are going to be supply chain constraints with electric uh, vehicle components for some time because of demand. And also because of the in, you know, increased demand, you have to then get the lithium and cobalt. And then there's also um, going towards sort of lithium uh, iron phosphate batteries, which are more energy, which are last longer. And so there's a lot of interesting technology coming out. Okay, so now we're going to do, um, so the fast charging. This is kind of maybe the birth, sort of, if you're not Tesla, of fast charging in America. You guys remember the Volkswagen Dieselgate, right? 
Volkswagen cheated on its emissions, got a big slap on the hand. It agreed to pay $2.8 billion in a settlement in the United States. And Electrify America, which are the stations you'd see in Sam's Club, grew out of that. So if we could play the video on that, this is sort of uh, a commercial that analyzes, I think, creative, very, very creatively their um, um, getting over the diesel gate. That's a cool commercial. I like it. Simon Garfunkel, <laughs> the bus, right? The bus reimagined as the buzz, a fully electric uh, bus that's going to be produced in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 2024. Um, and I, I just want to take a break for a second and talk about manufacturing because we live in a, this is a very interesting time in which we live because we are now onshoring so much of what we're doing, right? Because we're gonna be in this competition with China and the age of just naked globalization is probably over. And so we're going to reshore some of our technologies and we're going to build out that in the United States. And the cheapest place to do that in the United States in terms of labor is the Southeast. So more recently, um, you know, Toyota has a battery factory in North Carolina. Uh, there's a, I forget the name of the company, but there's a, there's a tractor company, it's all electric, that's in North Carolina. Arrival, which is gonna make uh, vans for uh, UPS, is based in Charlotte. And there is a, a new company from Vietnam. That's right, they're not making our t-shirts. They're bringing cars here. 2,000 acres, about an hour west of Raleigh, they have purchased land and are gonna set up a factory, employ North Carolinians to build electric vehicles and that will be their center of North American manufacturing. It is huge. And the company's name is Vinfast, and I'd never heard of them until I saw that announcement. But it's interesting that so many people are getting into the game. In Georgia, of course, Georgia has tons of EV manufacturing, and we'll have a Rivian plant pretty soon. Tennessee has done great things. The Cadillac Lyric is being made south of Nashville. Chattanooga is always already doing great things with VW. They're going to make the VW ID4 there and the bus that we just saw the commercial of. So it's this, it's great. I mean, it's, you know, foreign companies with, with domestic plants employing Americans, and then those Americans buy those vehicles, and it helps the economy. So North Carolina needs to be, of course, South Carolina is also now competitive, right? They have BMW, Volvo. <clears throat> That's all I'll say about that for now. All right. All right, I need to get out of that and get back to this. Okay. So how to charge, right? Because this is a question a lot of people have. How do you charge this thing? You know, how do you, how do you charge an electric vehicle? How, can you plug in a cell phone? I mean, most everyone in this room is old enough to have a rotary phone or the kind you pull off the wall and you press the numbers and... Go away, mom, you know, and you have to talk because you're having a private conversation. I remember those days, there were no cell phones, uh, but we learned how to plug them in, right, with cell phones. Well, plugging in a car is no different, almost no different. There are different types of charging, and we're going to talk about the different types just now. So uh, how to charge at home, office, and, and on a road trip. Those employ different types of charging. Level one charging draws power from the standard 110 outlet, right? Three prong, goes right in the standard plug at your house and you hook it up. A lot of times it comes with the car, unless it's a Tesla now, they want you to buy it extra because people weren't using them. So you plug in and that's an example of one right there. You can see the three prong and it just plugs right in. Now what that will do, it's called a trickle charge. Uh, so it will get you in most cars about three to four miles per hour of range. So think 12 hours. 12 hours, you're going to get 36 to 48 miles. That's about it. That's what we get. And I have a, um, actually, we're getting about four, about, about four, a little over four. So I'll plug in the RAV4 Prime at night, 12 hours later, unplug it, I have a full charge, I go to the VA, I almost get back, that kind of thing. But if you have a pure battery, battery electric vehicle, then in many cases, a level one won't be enough. You can still use it, but you might want a level two, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the pros of a level one is that, like I said, it usually comes with the vehicle. It's usually sufficient for daily driving if you're not going to Asheville every day. Um, and you don't have to have an electric panel upgrade at your house 
because you're just plugging into a standard outlet. And it's also portable, so if you're, you know, you go on vacation, you get to an Airbnb, plug it in, you're not paying for the electricity, you're paying for the room. Uh, the cons of it, as I mentioned, you're not gonna get a lot of range out of it, but then that's not really its point, because it can only plug into a 110 outlet. Okay, so that's level one. Level two charging. Sir, yes, sir. yes. But no, we're a adding range. We're adding three to four miles per hour of range. So it's a different sort of take on that. So each hour, we're adding... Or each hour of charge. Each hour of charge, you're adding, add, adding three to four miles of range. Okay, sure. Um, level two charging. So this uses a 240, which... For those who don't know what a 240 is, it would be like your dryer outlet in your house, right? It requires a 240. Um, it requires a bipole breaker installed to the home's electric panel. Now, one of the challenges that can happen, that, that is unfortunate, but the Inflation Reduction Act will address some, is that if you live in an old home with a 100 amp panel, eh, putting in a 40 amp circuit, might not, you might not be able to do it. So, uh, but for homes that have a 200 amp panel, then it's usually you have some spare space in there. Uh, typical circuit sizes for level two charging, uh, 40 amps will enable 32 amps, right? Because it has to be oversized by, the circuit has to be oversized by 25%. Will enable, ena excuse me, enable 7.6 kW charging. A 60 amp will enable 11.5 kW charging, and 100 amps will enable 19.2. That might not mean anything to you, but in terms of charge time, that's what we're looking at here. So I just picked the Cadillac Lyric because because it has it's an out, it's a uh, EV that's coming out from Cadillac. I picked it because it just has about a 100 kW battery pack. So how long will it take to charge a Cadillac Lyric? Well, if you have this, you know. 7.6 kW charger, then it's gonna take almost 12 hours. If you have an 11.5, it'll take almost eight hours. And if you have a 19.2, which requires 100 amps, it would take just four hours and 41 minutes. Now, importantly, in most cases, you're not running out and driving all the way, as far as you can, all the way back to your house with like two or three miles of range left. So it's not a daily thing that you're just blowing through 300 miles all the time, right? So this is always going to be, even with a 7.6 kW charge, it's gonna be sufficient. Um, yeah, um, let's see here. So the way this works is too, if you have a garage, then you can stub out up to 40 amps and you can have a portable, you can plug it in because it's a 32 amp charger. If you do anything above 40 amps, you have to have it hardwired in, which is, you know, means you just sort of can't take it with you from place to place. Interestingly, if, you, if you're a Duke customer or a Duke Progress customer, they now have an incentive where they will pay you or they will rebate you up to $1,117 to stub out for an EV charger. So an electrician come to your house, they'll tap into your panel, they'll run it over, and the electrician will also install the level two charger you've purchased online, right? Duke just doesn't want to say installation of the level two charger because they don't want to pick winners and losers when it comes to the particular charger you pick. But that's a really generous incentive. So if you're Duke, but there's a catch to it, and the catch is this, when, in order to get that, you can't do it prospectively, you have to have registration for an electric vehicle that's housed at that address, and then they'll go through the rebate process, and I'm told it takes about 30 days. I was looking at getting that done at my mother's house in Charlotte, because we have Duke there, and I talked with an electrician, and he's like, we got to go, we got to go, I'm doing 500 of these a month. And I said, wait a second, we're going to talk for a couple more minutes. <laughs> he was doing 500, he and a team of guys were going around Charlotte, and they were installing 500 a month. And I don't go to Charlotte, I mean, I go there to see my mom, but I don't go there to like ride around. But I, I did this past time I went, and I went to see a friend in Matthews on the other side of Charlotte. And there are Teslas everywhere. And they're just, it's just, it's happening. And I went to the Tesla dealership, and I walked in because I wanted to see about a, a test drive with our police chief, because uh, we're going to go down there at some point and, and test drive Teslas. And so I just wanted, okay, can we get the police chief and a Tesla? And he said, oh, you know, we don't have any. I was like, your whole lot's full of them. He's like, yeah, they're all sold. 
And in the time I was talking to them, we talked for about 25 minutes, six people came in and just said, can I have my keys? And they just got, and they got in the car and left. That was their purchase process. You just did everything online in advance. You came in, got your keys, and you left. And if you needed a tutorial, they had people outside telling you how to park the car because, you know, it kind of does its own thing. That was amazing. So it was just it was really amazing. Yes? I'm not an electrician. I'm going to pass on that one. I'm going to pass on that one. I will say there's something called a Connect DER that's a collar that goes on the ex external, the, 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 the utilities meter on the outside of the house. And I think I've got some information at the end. But that could be a revolutionary technology because if you think about the energy that goes into your home, whatever it's rated for, you're not using that at all times. So what if you had a smarter system in the home that could modulate, right, control demand in the house? So you wouldn't ever go above your max load, right? It would modulate. So if you're running the dryer, then your car would charge at a lower rate because it would never go beyond a certain threshold. And then if the dryer went off, the car would pick back up its speeding again, uh, its charging again. And so those are ways around upgrading a service panel. We have a 200 amp service panel in our house, and I thought we were going to have to upgrade to a 600 amp system for all the things I wanted to do, and that's just not the case. We'd probably get away with maybe 300. Okay, I want to talk about integrating solar. Uh, there are a lot of companies now. Ford is partnering with Sunrun um, to do vehicle-to-grid charging. So imagine you drive your Ford F-150 Lightning up to the house, and your power goes out. What happens? Well, Ford has this really interesting system. They're serious. They're deadly serious about it, much more than maybe GM or definitely more than Toyota. They are Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, is very in this space. And what, what they imagine is that you pull up, just like in the commercial, and you're forward. Power goes out. This is true because it's important in California where there's rolling blackouts from time to time, forest fires, utilities turning off the power. And your Ford will, instead of it charging, instead of your house charging your car, the Ford would then charge the house and run, you know, it would reverse the flow of electricity. And so it would deplete it down. So you could run your house for maybe up to seven days. And blackouts usually don't last that long. Like think of ice storms around here and severe snowfall or some drunk person hitting a telephone pole and knocking out the transformer. Um, so that's a really interesting technology. And I think the thing about it is it sort of obviates the need then for a Genrac generator. Why spend the money on that when your, your car can serve a dual purpose? It can not only get you from A to B, but in times of need, it can actually power your house. Yes. Yes, the technology is built into the vehicle, but they're partnering. They've got their own, like, Ford system, whatever. They're partnering with Sunrun. And anyways, that rollout is coming. But it's fully enabled to do vehicle-to-grid charging. And if we could run, I want to run, talk about solar integration. So there's a video here attached, Nick, to this slide. So SolarEdge is, a, is a, a PV inverter company. They've, it's an Israeli company. They've kind of cornered the market. They make a really great product. And what they're advertising there is your ability to sort of, you know, drive on sunshine, right, which is novel. And why not? Light travels 93 million miles from the sun, hits a sheet of glass, and you can drive your car off of it. That's cool. It's really cool. Okay, we're going to take a short break. It's 11 o'clock. We're going to wrap at 11.30. Let's take a seven-minute break to stretch and then we'll just, we'll run through the rest of it real quick, okay? And I'll field any questions um, now and, or, you know, just individually and then at the end of this session here. So seven minutes. 
Yes. There's, there's one, is it Hyundai? Okay. Okay, thanks, All right, so I'm going to talk more slowly, but I'm going to move faster. Um, we have about eight slides left, and we have 18 minutes. So some of this I'm going to glance over. Um, level 2 chargers. So how much does it cost to get a Level 2 charger? As I mentioned, if you're a Duke customer, you can benefit from up to a $1,117 rebate. But generally speaking, a level two charger, if you buy a Tesla charger today, the wall charger, level two, $400 on Tesla's website. You go on Amazon, look at any number of level two chargers. There's ChargePoint, there's Juicebox, lots of different op options there. And those will typically run probably in the six to $700 range. I've checked with some electricians and depending, not very complex installations may run six to $800, but of course, if you want to do that, you should get estimates. And then there's something called a Connect DER, which will, can tap into the meter outside your house. It's a collar that can more easily enable level two charging for homes that have only a 100 amp service. Um, so the cons, as I mentioned, for level two, um, you have to really look at what your load is in your house and how full your panel is before um, going in that direction. But if you don't know how to do it, an electrician can tell you how much available amperage you have in your panel. Okay. Level three, finally, also known as DC fast charging. So, again, Sam's Club, uh, any Tesla supercharger, this is DC fast charging, which means it's not alternating current, it's direct current. You pull up. There's this big honking, like, you know, like cooling device behind it, and you take the cord and you plug in, and it's usually about this big around, and it can be fairly unwieldy, and you plug it into the car, and you start charging fast. And why do you want to do that? Because you're on a road trip. Ordinarily, you would not, unless you needed a little so-called splash and go. So these will be located close to major points, uh, roadways, interstates, and that infrastructure is being built out even better than it is now, and will hopefully be in lots more places soon. So what does it look like? If, you, if anybody's been to J Creek, J Creek has, with Haywood EMC, uh, a DC fast charger. It has the minimum, I believe it's 50 kW, and you can go all the way up to 350 kW. So that's a lot of power, a lot of energy, rather, going into a car. What does that mean in terms of charge time? Well, there are early adopters, you're going to meet some outside today, and I was one, and these are people who like to suffer. So you would pull up to a fast charger, and if it were wintertime, and of course it's raining, you'd plug in, and I remember being in a bolt and it taking an hour and 20 minutes, and I'd think to myself, geez, what am I going to do? And that's when I started learning Portuguese. <laughs> but all, all jokes aside, some of that early adopting stuff, you'll still, still hear people talk about, oh, it takes forever. No, the newer vehicles, the manufacturers understand that they need to get the vehicles to charge quickly. So pictured here is a Kia EV6. This is the newest offering from Kia. Now, if you're thinking Kia Hyundai and you're thinking, eh, not really my cup of tea, I get it because they've often been known for value for money. But in the electric age, Kia and Hyundai are taking it out a whole new door. And if you don't believe it, that car costs, it can cost up to $68,000. So they are really taking it out a whole new direction. This vehicle will charge from 10 to 80% in 18 minutes. That's kicking the tires. That's going to the bathroom, getting a cup of coffee, and we're on a road trip. And you do a few stretches, right, like you do when you're on a road trip. So that's impressive. So that starts to get comparable to the gas station experience. Except there's probably, when you pull up to one of these chargers, there's no, you know, lottery tickets and cigarettes and alcohol to buy, and candy bars. Um, so I mentioned the Chevy Bolt can take up to, the, the newer ones can take up to about 50 minutes of charge. And that's something to look at when you're looking at a vehicle. What's its state of charge? Go to the manufacturer's websites. We don't have enough time today to get into all the long, long list of cars that are being produced. Go to the websites. They're gonna tell you the specifications. They very much want you to buy one, so they're gonna play videos and have all kinds of cool things for you to look at. Okay, so DC Fast Run. This is some pictures of what they look like. Electrify America, here on the left. 
That's what you might see at Sam's Club. On the right is Tesla. Those are the superchargers. Think outlet malls in Asheville. Now, currently, still, the Tesla superchargers are proprietary to Tesla customers only for fast charging. They're going to change that, they say. They're doing that in Europe already and rolling it out to other manufacturers. So we'll see how that progresses. But the great thing about Tesla, as I understand it, is you pull up to it and the thing just works. You don't have to fob in with your card and your phone and the pouring rain. I've had to do this in Knoxville. Come on, work, work. And then you plug it in and there's a problem. And, you know, sometimes that happens. Tesla, you pull up and apparently the whole system understands your car. It knows your car. And you just plug in and then it bills your account. So it's very elegant. Okay, so quickly, we have ugh, not much time. We're going to talk, we're not going to talk about a bunch of new EVs. We're not going to talk about Eve Talls or electrical, ver vertical, uh, electrical vertical takeoff and landing, kind of like human drones that are being, you know, China's doing some stuff with that and so are we. We're not going to talk about electric boats because those exist and they're pretty cool. But we are going to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. There's a caveat here and I want to say this. The House voted on this yesterday, right? And it's the, they, they accepted the same language as the Senate bill, okay? So I was up till four in the morning working on some of this stuff. So what I want to say is I'm not an accountant and the rules have not been written, right? The rules have to be interpreted. The language of the legislation has to be interpreted and then rules are made. But these are some general things to glean from it. Okay, why the in Inflation Reduction Act? Well, we could talk, we talked some about on reshoring and onshoring U.S. manufacturing. So Washington recently has sort of discovered that we're too reliant on other countries. COVID made that abundantly clear. You couldn't get masks, gloves, nothing. And of course, computer chips were a major problem for automakers and helped drive inflation in this country because you had 10 people chasing seven vehicles for sale and that just escalates the price. But interestingly, in a bipartisan effort of you know, Senators Burr and Tillis in North Carolina signed on to this was the CHIPS Act, which reshores uh, microchip investment in this country, which is important. Of course, at the end of the day, you're paying people to do something. You know, they took it offshore. Now you're going to pay them to bring it back onshore. Maybe they shouldn't have left to start with, but that's kind of water under the bridge. So, and that's important because who has ambitions on Taiwan? China. They've made it very clear. And who makes the world's best semiconductors? Taiwan. So we need to get that going and get it going in a fast way. So there has been some bipartisan effort, unfortunately not with the Inflation Reduction Act. Okay. So what is this also about? The Inflation Reduction Act is also about the U.S. has been too lax in supporting nascent technologies. We used to do this and we used to do it really well. And then we just sort of said, well, the private, the private sector should do everything except that there's a problem with the private sector and it's an economic, uh, it's an economic term called uh, market failure. You don't enter into something that's so new and so risky because you can't bet everything on it. You don't want to lose your market share to a competitor. So you don't invest in those leading technologies. But we, but, so what this will do is it will juice university research. Right? What happens with multi-million dollar grants in places on the, like the farm at Stanford? Right? You come up with this idea in the lab, and then you figure out a way to monetize it. And then you start a company. And when you start that company, you partner with VW, and you partner with Porsche, and you partner with Ford. And then they buy into it and invest in the business, and then the technology moves forward. And that's a lot of what this is about. There's our favorite guy, <laughs> senior senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. Hold out for two years, but we got a bill. Uh, America has a bill, and this is this not political. I just want to talk about some things in it. So the Inf Inflation Reduction Act cancels the 200,000 unit limit that auto manufacturers could use to help customers claim a $7,500 tax credit for the purchase of an EV. Okay, so George W. Bush signed this in 2008. If you buy an EV, you get a $7,500 tax credit if you're eligible for that, right? Because it's not, you have to have the income burden to get the $7,500 tax credit. Well, Tesla and GM were like, okay, let's make cars. And Tesla really benefited from some of that uh, you know, great recession money. Um, but they blow through their 200,000 
And then all of a sudden, there's no more tax credit for customers. So in comes you know, VW and Hyundai and Kia, and they're like, oh, our, our vehicles are eligible for the $7,500 tax credit. And they're not anymore. So who's more competitive? The Kias, the Volkswagens, the Hyundais, and they're Johnny-come-latelys. So if you don't think that GM had someone knocking, like lobbyists knocking on doors for the last two years, you would be mistaken. I'm sure they did. They camped out in, in, the, in, the, in the Senate building because they were very interested in having this tax credit restored. Tesla's getting the tax credit restored, too. If you're going to do it for GM, you've got to do it for Tesla. Tesla probably doesn't need it, but importantly, there are some people out there that are on the cusp of affording a Tesla, right? A Tesla that's $54,000, if you get a $7,500 tax credit, maybe they, they inch into that affordability. Okay. Okay, so the other thing this does, so there's going to be a $7,500 tax credit, but there's an asterisk, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The, the, so the tax credit also, this also creates, this bill also creates a law, a $4,000 tax credit for used vehicles that cost, that are priced under $25,000. That's very important because as we mentioned earlier, two-thirds of the cars purchased in this country are used cars. So you don't want just to have the first person go out and claim the $7,500 tax credit and they're making $100,000 a year and then somewhere down the line, someone can't get it. So this is a good thing. This will help accelerate the used EV market. There are some caveats though. So the new bill, new law, excuse me, law on Monday probably when President Biden signs it, caps eligibility for tax credit for cars that are less than $55,000. Okay, so $55,000, that's it. So if you're going to buy a Lucid Air, too bad because the lowest price trim is like $78,000. You can't get it. So the car has to be $55,000 or less. If it's a truck, SUV, or van, it has to be $80,000 or less. Some manufacturers, so if you're going to buy a Ford F-150 Lightning and you're going to get the low trim or the next trim, you're going to be eligible. If you're going to get the Platinum Edition that has all the bells and whistles, you will not be eligible because the price of the truck is above $80,000. And that probably just kind of makes sense, right? Because you want to be able to, to, to have some equity so that if you can have the $4,000 use tax credit, why should someone making $400,000 a year get a tax credit when they really can afford to buy it otherwise? The other thing is there are income requirements. So if you make $150,000 or more as an individual, you're, or you are ineligible. If, you, if you're a couple making $300,000 or more, you are also ineligible for the EV tax credit. But there's a transition period. And the transition period, and this is where it gets kind of fuzzy, are those customers in 2022, this year, who have a binding order, may elect to claim the old tax credit. So it doesn't matter, 400000 a year, car costs $100,000, you can still take the $7,500 tax credit if you have a binding order. And you have to have that before the bill is signed. So I've been on websites looking at a lot of stuff. Interestingly, the manufacturers are all over the place. Some of them are upset. Kia and Hyundai are upset. It's, it's, it's funny to watch. You get to see this big thing play out because it's really about juicing a manu American manufacturing here. So VW, are they going to get it? It depends. If you buy an ID4 that's going to be made in Chattanooga, absolutely, because it has to be finally assembled in America in order to qualify for the tax credit. And if this all sounds very confusing, it is. But it will become clear as the rules are written. Each manufacturer will say, this is our model and this qualifies and this one does not. If you went to a dealer today, they wouldn't be able to say anything. Okay, so like I said, most of them are flying blind. But things will be clear soon. In case you're wondering, at the bottom right is a, is a Rivian R1T. That's an electric truck. And above it is the Lucid Air, which was a company founded by Peter Rawlinson who used to be, I think, the chief technology officer for Tesla. Or, or maybe, no, he was on the team for the Model S development. Okay, just briefly, drool-worthy EVs. Because, you know, I've been to Marinello, Italy. I've gone to the Ferrari place and looked at Ferraris, and it wasn't because I could afford one. It's because I just want to see something really cool. And sometimes people want to see that. So this isn't about, hey, open up your pocketbooks and flash out 150 grand, but these are really cool. So on the left is the Audi uh, e-tron GT, really awesome car. It's got, you know, it's very sculpted. It must spend a lot of time in the gym. 
And then the Hummer super truck up here, which we've probably all seen commercials about during the Super Bowl. And then on the bottom here is the Mercedes EQXX. It's just a concept. Mercedes said, we're going to take a ton of money and throw it at it and see what we can come up with. And what they came up with is a car that can drive 700 miles, has solar panels embedded in it, and it's super cool. And it's not that Mercedes is ever going to make that. The point is, when you make something like that, it's going to then press down through your product line, right, for all your, all your other premium vehicles. That's what you do. You take something that's just totally, you know, a 10 out of 10, and then you push it down through your segments. Now let's talk about the other end. The practical, affordable EV. This is a Chevy Bolt. This is, we got four minutes. This is a Chevy Bolt. This year, with GM, uh, some, some, some uh, rebates from GM at the dealership, $26,500 for that vehicle. And on January 1, 2023, the Bolt is eligible for a $7,500 tax credit. That means that car, if GM sticks with its, you know, discounting, could be $19,000. Boom, game over. An EV that costs $19,000, it gets 259 miles of range, goes zero to 60 in five and a half seconds, and it has an interior space of a of, of small SUV. Oh, I used to own one, and that's a better version of it. And for $19,000, it's a lot less than the 40 that it used to be. So that's a game changer. And other companies are going to do that too. And there's other companies coming that you've never heard of probably. Have you heard of Great Wall, BYD, NEO, Xiaoping, China? They're coming, they're gunning for America. They say they're not, but they're setting up research facilities, you know, because it's competition, it's America. So the American manufacturers, the European manufacturers are gonna have to compete with that. And so it's all about this race to get as many EVs and to drive down costs so that you have all kinds of segments. You have the person that wants to buy the completely excessive Hummer and someone who wants affordability. Okay. EVs are coming out every day. How can I get one? This will be the last slide. It's tough. Tough. Uh, we're supposed to take delivery of something called a Fisker Ocean, maybe. And I'm like the, maybe the 200th person in the world to have a reservation on it, and it has over 55,000 reservations. I'm excited for it. I made my reservation December 23rd, 2019. And here we are. They're going to go into production November 17th, and then they're going to come out to the world. And I live in Waynesville, so who knows? Maybe they'll put me in the bottom of the list because of transportation issues. I don't know. So if you go into a dealership today, a couple things can happen. One is they'll say, get on a wait list. They'll call you in a year. Call you in six months. Fine, get on a wait list. They might ask you for $500, fully refundable. At least you're on a wait list. Or you could start looking all over the country for places. Or you could go locally, and they might have some things sitting in a, like an EV6, sitting in, uh, over by the outlet malls. And, but unfortunately, what's happened is, because they're in such demand, they'll, take, they'll say, well, that's, we're not doing MSRP. We're charging $12,000 over MSRP. So if you want to buy that, I mean, I'm not here to tell people what to do with their money. If you want to buy a car for $12,000 over MSRP, fine. But I, th I think it's stupid. I mean... <laughs> Cars generally don't appreciate. They're not homes, right? They depreciate over time. Eventually, they're worth almost nothing. So pay what you will, but just, you know, buyer beware in this market. That's true for anything, right? Because there's expectations built in with the public that, oh, it costs more, it'll cost more tomorrow. No. Uh, but you can find honest dealerships. The thing about Kia and Hyundai, I've called them and I've complained, and they have no power over their dealerships, Right? They give them the cars, and the dealers can sell them for what they want. So find a place, if you're looking for a car, that can sell you a car at no more than MSRP, because it's just ridiculous. Okay, cars we have here. We have the Audi Q4 uh, e-tron. That's a midsize SUV. Nice car. Circa $45,000, $50,000. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 on the right-hand side. It's kind of this pixelated-looking, uh, interesting car. Down on the bottom... BMW i4, what do you notice about that? Looks like a combustion BMW, right? It's using just the standard platform, and they've taken some batteries and put it underneath, but it has really good reviews. And then on the right is the Chevy Blazer that came out a few weeks ago. It's going to be fully electric, end of 2023, 300 miles of range, and they've got the super sport trim, and then goes all the way down to the base model. They're also making a police interceptor edition, right? So you don't have to trick out a vehicle to make it electric for a police force, you can just buy it spec'd out that way. 
And that's, that's really interesting. And um, so, so lots of cool things happen. How can you get one? You can make reservations. You can put down some money, do your research, go to the websites, talk to people. There's going to be lots of people outside today. The Blue Ridge EV Car Club is here. WNC Tesla owners are here. Ask people tons of questions. Ask them tons of questions about their experience because that's really what it's about. Don't take my word for it. Take everyone else's word for it too. Okay. And we're not, I'm not going to take any questions, but I'll be glad to stick around for a little bit, talk to folks, and then we're going to go out. I've got a couple of cars outside I want to show too. So thank you for coming. Thank you for spending some of your Saturday here. <laughs> I very much appreciate it.